Our guests today are a trio of Sherman and Sterling partners up in New York City, Richard Alsop, Jillian Emmett Muldowen, and Christina Trauger, who are part of the team that authored the 18th Annual Corporate Governance and Executive Compensation Survey. That survey covers the top 100 public companies by market cap and revenue. It's quite an undertaking. Thank you for doing it. I'm Brock Romanek, today on Zippy Point. IPO governance. So it is a culture shock for a company going public because you have to start being transparent about your numbers, your disclosure. But governance changes too. There's the listing standards and just investor expectations. So Richard, what have you been seeing with IPO governance in, in over this last year? Yeah, thanks, Brock. Um, look, um, you know, the IPO governance section of our corporate governance survey was a little bit of an experiment that we put in place. Um, starting in uh, 2016, I believe, uh, you know, our first cohort of IPO companies that we measured to sort of set baseline standards was in, uh, it was the 2015 cohort. Um, and, you know, it differs from what we do on most other, um, uh, most of the other governance articles, which we try to make database in the sense that um, the, um, the, the comparability is different, right? We, in for our regular articles, we try to evaluate the top 100 companies, which has a sort of special formula, but stays relatively consistent year over year. Um, with IPO companies, obviously, um, you know, it depends on who went public last year. Um, there's a lot of different attributes of different companies, uh, and obviously different numbers of companies go public each year. Um, but what we wanted to see is, um, you know, uh, uh, whether um, uh, voting policies that ISS initiated for the first time in 2015, um, where they said, hey, you know, um, we've really focused on broadly public companies in the past with respect to certain, you know, practices, governance practices we don't like, but we're going to start to focus on IPO companies and to the extent that I, they come out of the box with policies that um, we find um, are not appropriately shareholder friendly we may take actions against um, directors or heads of nominating committees or, you know, the like, um, in order to, um, you know, emphasize that we think those policies should change. And we wanted to see um, whether they, we could detect any measurable trend um, in how IPO companies approach um, the questions, at least the questions that are not mandated by you know, um, the listing standards, as you said, um, where they're making optional decisions about how to structure um, their governance, uh, you know, in their uh, certificates of incorporations, bylaws, um, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, this is, I guess, now the fifth cohort this, this year that we measured. We've, we've been through 2019, and there have been some, you know, ups and downs um, in the data that have demonstrated, um, you know, that things change year over year a little bit, depending on the number of companies and, you know, what kind of companies they are, et cetera. Um, but overall, I think our conclusion is that um, the ISS, um, you know, approach, um, which, by the way, did result in did result in um, a number of recommendations to vote against directors, um, who um, approved governance practices at, at, you know, many of these IPO companies over this, this five-year period uh, did not result in a significant change um, in the practices they were most focused on. And when I say the practices that ISS was most focused on, what I mean are, number one, dual class structures. So, um, you know, a super voting class and a, and a public um, single vote class of equity. Uh, number two, classified boards, um, which they have, um, you know, said in the past that they don't think it's an appropriate um, board structure, you know, for public companies as well as for IPO companies. And, um, and number three, um, super majority voting requirements and charters that basically prevent shareholders from undoing practices put in place at the time of the IPO. And most typically those will relate to things like the classified board. So if you put a classified board structure in place, you might also have a super majority vote required to take that out um, or, um, you know, shareholder uh, rights to call shareholder meetings, for example, would be another example of things that might be under super, super majority um, amendment provisions. So these things have, um, you know, typically 
um, after um, ISS's change in approach been written up as um, you know negatives um, for the company in terms of governance uh, and um, led to recommendations to vote against either you know the entire board or members of the board who were on at the time of the IPO or the head of the nominating committee for example um, and as a result they have led to lower votes um, in some cases than you would normally expect mostly um, you know, in the past, and traditionally, um, independent directors at IPO companies could expect to get, you know, 98, 99% of positive votes to continue on the board. Um, those um, votes, you know, get driven down by a negative recommendation to some extent, um, but um, rarely anywhere near, um, you know, um, a, a majority vote level. I mean, they're, they're more like, you know, 80% or something like that. So they, they end up with lower votes. Um, but you're not seeing, um, you know, a wholesale trend to abandoning these kind of types of protections. Um, you know, when we started this process, we argued that, you know, there is a basis for differentiating IPO companies from broadly public companies, um, you know, in terms of their governance practices. Number one, um, investors have essentially voted with their pocketbooks, right? I mean, the, the prospectus discloses all the uh, governance mechanics, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the um, uh, investors can weigh in um, by deciding what they're willing to pay um, for the security. Uh, and, you know, they go in with wide, eyes wide open. So um, that's, that's the first, um, you know, um, question or, or issue as to whether that, you know, thesis holds up. Uh, the second one is that IPO companies, you know, essentially when they go to market um, are, um, you know, arguing for a growth story. And I think lots of investors are willing to give um, the management team that brings the company public a little time to try to affect that growth story. And when you think about these traditional concerns about these, um, you know, um, governance uh, mechanisms like classified board, um, what shareholders worry about is management entrenchment, right? And clearly, you don't want management in a, entrenched in a broadly public company where shareholder value is being destroyed or at least not created year after year after year. But if the IPO thesis is, here's the plan, this is the team, here's how we're going to get there, it takes a little while to play out and giving the company some time to play it out, particularly at, at a time when it's in a relatively vulnerable stage, having just gone to market doesn't seem like such a bad idea. Now, um, you know, to, to be fair to ISS, their, um, you know, their concept has usually said, if you're going to put these practices in place, have a sunset provision on them. You know, let's see where you've said, you know, we're going to have these in place for a couple years, and then it's going to sunset. And um, our experience have, is that most companies uh, going public, despite that option, have not adopted a sunset provision. They've, they've, you know, opted for a sort of traditional out of the gate IPO practices, including in many cases, classified boards, supermajority provisions without a sunset. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and, and that I think is just a reflection of the fact that um, you are bringing new directors on, right? You've got a management team's just going to make decisions as it's going public. You're bringing new directors on who haven't had a lot of time to evaluate um, what's right for the corporation, what what uh, governance model makes sense, um, and so um, nobody's prepared to insist that oh yeah we need a we need a sunset on that provision because you know we might get you know slightly lower votes in director um, elections, um, but they are obviously thinking in their minds most likely that hey you know as time goes on we need to evaluate our governance practices and you know, think about whether they're right for the company as it um, matures and grows and becomes more broadly public. Um, so that's, you know, that's been sort of the experience um, uh, over time on IPO governance uh, and what we've surveyed. The other thing I should mention um, that's not really in our, our survey for, um, for this year, but is a trend we're noticing um, uh, in IPO companies over the last six months or so, uh, is that, um, you know, a case that was recently decided in Delaware, um, the Salzburg case, which 
um, clarified that um, companies could put in an exclusive forum provision for Securities Act claims um, uh, against the company. So, you know, um, civil liability claims against the company for, um, you know, disclosure problems in prospectuses related to equity offerings, um, you know, are uh, enforceable. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you can put that in your charter now um, or in your bylaws and um, try to limit um, the ability of plaintiffs to bring cases simultaneously in federal courts and state courts. Uh, and that's been very attractive to, um, to many companies because um, trying to defend a civil lawsuit uh, on Securities Act liability in multiple jurisdictions at once um, is, you know, obviously expensive, not all that desirable, and you can have um, the um, litigation take different paths in the different uh, jurisdictions. So uh, that is a trend that we're seeing uh, more and more companies adopt um, out of the gate governance policies. And I wouldn't think it would matter whether it's a SPAC or a more traditional route to go public. It's what your governance practices are once you're public that matter in terms of ISS or Glass-Lewis or what they're disclosing. Yes, um, th that's true. Although, um, you know, SPACs obviously are a little bit of a different animal because there is an expectation that, you know, um, on the, on the um, D-SPAC, right, the, the merger, um, you'll see policies adopted that, um, sort of reflect uh, the corporate structure and the, the company, um, uh, you know, once it has a real business as opposed to being a SPAC. But, um, you know, they are still subject to the um, listing, um, the governance listing rules. But I don't see them, certainly don't see them adopting more, you know, you know less aggressive um, kinds of approaches. Um, you know, um, they probably have a little less concern about things like uh, an activist coming in or, you know, um, you know, takeover attempt because who's going to attempt to take over us back, right? There's, there's just not much there, you know, uh, and there's all kinds of protections to, uh, you know, to keep it um, sort of lined up and, and doing that first acquisition. Great stuff, Richard. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.